Hi everyone, my name is Brian Dias. When I was growing up, I wanted to be a Catholic priest, a detective, a radio jockey, and a beach volleyball player. Instead, what I am is an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Southern California's Keck School of Medicine, and I direct a research laboratory at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. My lab studies how stressful experiences impact not only the individuals who directly experience them, but also their descendants. We are motivated to do this work because we believe that in understanding how legacies of stress echo and reverberate across generations lies our ability to halt them. Now, when I tell people that I'm a neuroscientist, I'm mostly met with two responses. You don't look like a neuroscientist and you must be really smart. Now I understand that there might be a certain picture that comes to mind about what a neuroscientist or a scientist in general is supposed to look like. However, without belaboring the point, all I will say is that, that in the 22 years that I've been doing science, I've had the privilege of working on science and learning science from individuals of different nationalities, religions, political affiliations, gender orientations, self-identified disabilities, shapes, sizes, colors, from individuals with long hair, with short hair, with no hair, people who have tattoos and piercings, people who call themselves introverts and extroverts, you name it. This is one of the many things that I love about science. The fabric of scientific discovery is sewn together from the wondrous diversity that is humanity. In the next few minutes, I'm gonna turn my attention to the you must be really smart response that I get when I tell people that I'm a neuroscientist. What I'd like to emphasize is that while scientists, myself included, may be smart, note, I said may, what we really are is being extremely good at bouncing back from failure and rejection. I intend to use several instances from my own career to achieve this emphasis. I grew up in Bombay, India, playing cricket, football, that's soccer, and volleyball in the streets. Raised by a father who had an air conditioning business and a mother who had sacrificed her career for my brother and I, I was educated in classrooms where I was one out of 85 students, drilled in the memorization of text with little understanding of that. Against this backdrop, becoming a scientist was the last thing I saw myself as. I never even knew that that was a career. While I studied life sciences in college, I had never actually conducted scientific research. At that time in India, doing undergraduate research was not really an option. Neither was there too much opportunity, nor resource. And besides, I was playing way too much volleyball. I only half joke with people when I tell them that I am a wannabe beach volleyball player trapped in the body of a scientist. I was coaching volleyball at the time that I received a call and an opportunity that has changed my life. That call was from a Dr. Vidita Vaidya, who was setting up a laboratory at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. I can't say what Dr. Vaidya saw in me, but I owe my start in science and everything that has followed to her. While in Dr. Baidya's lab, the scientific concepts that were just words in my textbooks and that I had memorized by rote leapt out at me and it was exhilarating to see and to do science. I was bitten by the science bug and I wanted more. One way of course to get more was to apply to graduate schools in the United States. And apply I did at a time when we had to mail in individual applications by the DHL couriers that cost us a fair amount of money, I applied to 13 schools in the United States, one, three. 
and then their responses trickled in by snail mail. One polite rejection after another. Twelve of them in total. One acceptance from the University of Texas at Austin. While I could say that I was actively undeterred by all the rejection letters, to be honest, they passed me by passively without denting my self-worth. I attribute this to my having grown up with very low self-esteem, only to actively develop self-confidence as a teenager by teaching myself how to do so from books. Coincidentally, a technique that I also used to teach myself how to swim. I wouldn't recommend either strategy, but they worked for me. So happy as a clam, I left for Austin, Texas to pursue a PhD in neuroscience. Of course, with the obligatory pressure cooker that my mom insisted that I shove into one of my two allotted suitcases so that I could make dal, but that I never used. My time in graduate school was special. Sure, there was time to play men's club volleyball and start running marathons to shed the excess weight gain from eating a Snickers ice cream cone every day. But for the most part, I lived, ate, and was breathing science 24 seven in Dr. David Cruz's laboratory in the basement of a building on the UT Austin campus. Experiments worked, but in science, experiments need to be written up for publications. Here's where I found that my binge watching several Bollywood movies a day as a boy in Bombay and the lack of any writing practice in my school environment had not done me any favors. While by my own admission, my writing was particularly bad, what was jarring was hearing comments like, it's obvious that English is not your first language and it's apparent that you have not had an American education. I can't say why I was not deterred by such constructive feedback, but it flowed off me like water off a duck's back. I was doing science, I was discovering things, I was in heaven. Once it was time to leave graduate school after my PhD, it was clear to me that I wanted to pursue academic science, that is become a professor of neuroscience. Not being savvy, nor aware enough to have read that only 8% of PhDs actually land academic jobs, I did what was needed to push me towards an academic career. I applied for postdoctoral positions to continue my scientific apprenticeship. After a few interviews, I had the privilege of joining the now late Dr. Bruce Baker's laboratory, just as he moved his lab from Stanford University to the HHMI Genalia Farm Research Campus in Ashburn, Virginia. Genalia is a special place. It provides a wealth of resources for amazing scientists to wrestle with big audacious scientific questions. So you can imagine how I felt when I, who had spent most of his PhD in the deserts of West Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, catching lizards, for my PhD, showed up in Genalia, like an imposter, like I did not belong. It was so obvious that my wife, who was visiting me at Genalia, six years into a long distance relationship by this time, asked me why my usually confident self had regressed to his boyish low self-esteem. And it wasn't only my wife. A colleague from my time at Genalia asked me as recently as a year ago where the scientist that I currently am was hiding while at Genalia. Compounding this imposter syndrome was the fact that I was doing experiments every single day and nothing was working. This continued not for a month or a year, but three years. I did experiments every single day for three years and nothing worked. Just take one look at my publication record and you will see that failure. No publications from 2009 to 2013. Everyone that I talked to said that my career was over. Everybody. I did not 
and don't hold any animosity towards them, they were probably right. But what they didn't know is that I had two superpowers propping me up. My wife, who is a thoughtful and amazing neuroscientist herself, and a gazillion gallons of grit and perseverance that I had cultivated over the years in India and in the United States. So I decided that I would give science one last shot and do another postdoc. Here, I had the good fortune of working with one of the most generous and smartest scientists that I know, Dr. Kerry Ressler. Dr. Ressler accepted me into his laboratory as a postdoc. So I packed my bags for Atlanta, leaving my wife pursuing her own postdoc in Baltimore, year eight of long distance. Slowly but surely, I found my scientific feet again. And in collaboration with Dr. Ressler, talented undergraduates, graduate students and postdoctoral colleagues, I published a few, dare I say, impactful papers. After seven years of postdocing and 15 years of being an apprentice, through my master's, PhD, and two postdocs, I was recruited as an assistant professor in Atlanta. What I'm gonna spare you with are the details of the 27 jobs that I applied to and got not a single interview. So there I was at age 35, starting off as an assistant professor. But the journey was only starting, wasn't it? To sustain a laboratory, one needs to secure funding. Once again, my lack of experience in writing as a child and not too much opportunity at the time for international postdocs to write and secure grants came back to haunt me. I wrote 40 grants in my first four years as a PI. That's four zero and got two funded in year four. A lot a lot, a lot of failure and rejection. So much rejection that I ran out of startup money and had to let lab personnel go. Amongst all the failures that I'm talking to you about, this I count as my biggest failure to date. These individuals were amazing treasures and I'm indebted to them for being where I am today. After that, I almost had to shut my lab down and quit science. But then the grants hit. Quite the roller coaster. Yet here I am directing a research laboratory at one of the best children's hospitals in the country. How have I kept standing through the turbulent times of my career? Through an immense amount of self-belief, perseverance, hard work, and some amount of celestial help. However, independent of me being the captain of my own ship, I've also benefited from the mentorship, friendship, support, generosity of time and counsel of too many people to list here. I hope you know who you are, but to Dr. Zweider, Cruz, Baker, Ressler, and all these others, I am immensely grateful. So with gratitude and in celebration of my failures, if you're watching this video and contemplating becoming a scientist, but don't think you look like one or can be one, I want to tell you that you, like I, have every right to be a scientist. Or if you're watching this video as a scientist experiencing a valley in your career, no publication, short on grants, you know all the glamorous aspects of our profession. Know that you are not alone. I wish for you that you practice cultivating self-belief, perseverance, and self-kindness in any way you can. And if that doesn't come to you at this time, that's okay. Surround yourself with people who believe in you, who are kind towards you, and let them be the wind that props you up. The scientist, but more importantly, the human in you, deserves that and much more. I end with wishing you strength and continued curiosity as you navigate all the failures that are undoubtedly going to help you succeed.